Hi, my name is John Langford. I'm the CEO at Aurora Flight Sciences here in Manassas, Virginia. It's my pleasure today to talk to you about the future of on-demand mobility. The particular topic I wanted to talk address is, is the role of autonomy in on-demand mobility. And I've entitled this talk, When Will My Air Taxi Arrive? People have longed since the beginning of time to fly with as little accoutrement as possible. Uh, I spent a lot of my early career working on human-powered aircraft, culminating in a flight called Daedalus Project, which in which we flew from Crete to Santorini using nothing but a, a human as the both pilot and the engine for the aircraft. But that was a large and not really practical machine. Part of the idea of what GoFly is working at is to make a practical personal flying device. And that's what many of you are engaged in today. This pursuit has been around f literally for centuries, but the last few decades have seen literally hundreds of different of I ideas for practical or not so practical flying devices. A lot of that has centered around the where's my jetpack, the idea that people could have personal devices that would allow them to fly anytime um, they wanted to from point to point. I thought I'd introduce this topic by giving a quick overview of the air transportation system in general, which really is divided into four major parts today. You have the big transport aircraft, you have the business aircraft, the corporate aircraft community, the private aviation or general aviation uh, sector, and then there's the light sport aircraft. The transport category is the one that we, I think we all know the best. Uh, it's an amazing network around the world. Literally, you can be anywhere in the world uh, tomorrow. This is a fabulous system. It's extremely safe. It's been developed over the last 70 years. The second big category is business aircraft, corporate aviation. These are operated under a slightly different set of rules and regulations than the, than the, uh, the large commercial transports. They're also extremely safe and they operate in sort of a parallel network around the world. The third big category is personal transportation, personal aircraft, general aviation, uh, that individuals own and operate these airplanes. And then the fourth is a more recent category called light sport aircraft, which is really aimed at flying just for, for one person. It, it has a different degree of regulation altogether. So if you kind of lay these things out and, and look at them side by side, you can see that the passenger transport system is massive. Literally billions of passengers fly every year. Uh, you can get tickets that f uh, fly from city to city uh, multiple times a day. The, uh, uh, there are hundreds of passengers on each one of these airplanes. The cost is a few hundred dollars a ticket. But it's fairly expensive to get into that business yourself. If you want to become a licensed air transport pilot, it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's a major career step to do that. The business aviation is quite similar. Um, it's an on-demand system. It's not scheduled so that you can decide when you want to go. It accesses more airports, as in contrast to a few hundred airports in the United States served by commercial service. You can get into thousands of airports using general aviation class or business class airplanes. Um, the catch here is that it's fairly expensive. The operation of these airplanes is expensive, and the process for becoming a licensed operator of these airplanes is also fairly expensive and time consuming. The third category, general aviation, those are airplanes that people can own more or less like personal cars. It's on demand. You can fly from the same airport network that the, that the corporate aircraft do. It is Still relatively expensive compared to, say, uh, a, a car or a personal automobile, um, but the licensing requirements are actually much lower and it's accessible to a larger part of the population. And then the light sport aircraft is, a, is, is really a recent addition to try to lower the regulatory boundaries uh, even further um, and for people who are not interested in carrying passengers. Now what we really all want to do, of course, is shown here, the sort of vision system, which would be something that all of us could do, that we could go from anywhere to anywhere, anytime that we wanted, so point to point on demand. We'd like to be able to do it at the cost and the licensing of what it takes to have, say, a driver's license. 
and make it available to everybody. That's the goal of the GoFly competition. It's a vision that people have had for a really long time. So what are the barriers to that? It turns out that becoming a pilot in the current, in modern times, to operate in the current national airspace system is time consuming, it's expensive, and it's difficult. We can talk about uh, each of those in more detail, but essentially, learning how to operate the airplane, the stick and rudder skills, is only a small part of the skill set and the experience that's required to operate safely in the national airspace system. And because it's technically challenging, to make it safe, you have to be extremely proficient. And that means a high level of training, a high level of practice, and that adds up to the, uh, to the cost and the expense of, of becoming a pilot today. I think you can see that best in this chart. This, this chart shows the number of licensed pilots in the United States over the last 50 years. And you can see that it's a steady downward trend, and that's true in every category. If you look at each of the, the groups that we've talked about, um, they have generally been declining in the number of pilots, with the exception of the air transport ratings, which have generally grown with the traffic demand, and commercial aviation basically grows with gross domestic product, both in the United States and around the world. But even the growth in the air transport market has not been able to offset the steady decline in the other categories, which produces the overall decline over the last uh, 50 years or so. And that is despite many innovations aimed at reversing this trend and making flying more accessible. The whole idea of commercial glass cockpits, digital fly-by-wire, the advent of something called the General Aviation Revitalization Act, which really focused on insurance reform uh, in flying. Uh, we've had ballistic recovery systems. We've had the advent of composite structures. We've had glass cockpits go in. None of those innovations have been able to move the needle and reverse this persistent downward trend in the number of pilots operating in the national airspace. There is only one technology in the last 50 years that has demonstrated an ability to move the needle on this, and that is the technology of drones. Within the last three years, as the FAA has begun to certify, count, and now license drone operators, we've seen the number of drone operators go from essentially zero by the FAA's count to something that is now numbered in the millions. This is the sort of exponential growth people have been seeking for many years, and it's worth looking at why that happened. Very simply put, Drone technology is automation at work. When we talk about automation and air travel, this is fundamentally what we're talking about. Using computers, using software, using perception, algorithms, artificial intelligence, all combined together in a way to make the user experience more pleasant, to make it simpler, to make it easier, ultimately to make it much less expensive. And these technologies have been combined into the small commercial drones to take something that used to be very challenging, essentially flying a radio-controlled helicopter, and making it so easy to do that literally anybody can learn to do this without professional instruction. You open the box, use the, read the user's manual, and you can go fly. Now, that's led to a lot of enthusiasm for, well, let's just take this take the small commercial drones and scale them up. Make them bigger. Make them big enough to put people in it. It sounds like a simple problem, but it actually has a lot of complexities as you grow the scale. Not so much in the, in the initial part of the, uh, of the uh, autonomy parts. The software doesn't really know whether it's flying a quarter pound uh, quad rotor or a million pound you know, large aircraft like the 747. There are many degrees of, of sophistication between the two, primarily aimed at making uh, them more reliable, but, uh, but fundamentally the challenges are not so much in scaling the automation, it's in, it's in the certification and the other things. Let's talk about some of those other things for a moment. The first is, is uh, sort of what is the configuration. 
And on the left hand of this chart, I, I, I plot notionally sort of three different types of configurations. There's the multi-copters, which is the idea of what you see in the small commercial drones, um, and you could scale that concept. There's the traditional helicopter, which essentially takes a wing and rotates it. Uh, they're very efficient, but there's some complexities in terms of making them uh, work at all. And then there are airplanes with wings. Wings are a great thrust multiplier. If you think about what it takes to lift yourself off the ground, it takes a certain amount of power that's related to your weight. Uh, that demands a, s a certain amount of energy. What we've plotted on this chart is at a very uh, gross level, the energy required as a distance of the trip. And at short distances, when you, all you want to do is hover, the multi-copter designs are actually a fairly reasonable solution. There are some pluses and minuses. The, the helicopters, the, a single large rotor is generally more efficient than, than multiple small ones. Um, the wing is actually at a disadvantage in a hover because you're paying weight for no advantage. But as you begin to go some distance across the ground, the wing quickly buys itself onto, uh, onto the vehicle. Uh, it's a function of the lift to drag ratio. Essentially, it reduces the amount of thrust that you need out of the propulsion source um, by a factor of the, of the L over D. So that how far you want to go determines what the vehicle wants to look like. I now a lot of other uh, talks in the, in the GoFly lecture have sort of addressed that question, um, and I'll leave it to them on some of the details of that. I wanted to go now to the second question of sort of, do you use the same propulsion system for the vertical part of the flight and the horizontal part of the flight, or do you have separate ones? And again, the, there's a lot of uh, complexity in the details. We show here two designs that Aurora has worked on that look at both of these. One is the XV-24 configuration. It's a hybrid airplane, hybrid electric airplane that uses what we call distributed electric propulsion. It has 24 different electric-driven thrusters that are integrated into a tilt wing so that the wings tilt uh, vertically so for the vertical part of the flight and then they mechanically tilt over to a horizontal mode for the horizontal flight. The alternative to that is to use separate propulsion systems for the vertical and the horizontal parts of the flight. And that's shown on the right in this configuration that Aurora's tested that uses, in this case, eight different lift rotors for the vertical uh, part of the flight and one uh, propulsor, one larger propulsor for the horizontal part of the flight. Which is the right de uh, solution depends on the details of the mission, but they're part of what makes this a really fascinating trade space. Another thing that we talk a lot about in these is electric propulsion. And it's worth kind of looking at that because electric propulsion has some pretty interesting advantages. It's often touted that it's, uh, uh, it, it has no emissions, at least at the, at the point of operation on the airplane side. Um, it's generally mechanically simpler on this, and it's, it has some potential to be, uh, to be quieter as well. The big disadvantage of electric, or at least a battery propulsion, is if you look on the right-hand side of this chart, you look at the energy density, and you see that even the best batteries that we have today are really terrible compared to uh, gasoline or aviation fuel, which is up at the top. You could build a coal or a wood-powered airplane, and it would have much better energy density than a battery-powered airplane, and yet no one is proposing um, those, at least not to my knowledge. There, there may be some of them in the, in the GoFly competition, but when people talk about electric, they're generally talking about battery electric. The left-hand side of this chart kind of maps some of that out in some numbers. If you look at the black line at the top of this, this is a payload range curve. This is for a Cessna Caravan, which is a turboprop single engine used around the world for moving people and cargo. And the black line shows that you can carry a couple of thousand pounds of payload, and, you can, and that amount of payload you can carry generally declines as you go further out in range out to about a thousand nautical miles. If you were to take a caravan and make it battery powered, you would get the curves, the straight lines shown on the very left of this that are shown in orange, red, and blue. And those three curves are basically just 
How good of batteries have you got? The red line is basically what you can get today, and you can see that you take an airplane, which has pretty good performance, and you would turn it into something that could carry no payload at a range of about 50 nautical miles. And so you have to ask yourself, how does that buy its way onto the airplane, and why is electric propulsion a good idea in that case? The case gets better as the batteries get better. The blue line is something that you can't buy today, but maybe you could in a few years. But even that line, you have to ask yourself, is that really the right solution compared to the existing solutions in aviation? The, um, the middle lines, the purple and the turquoise lines in this graph, are what we call a hybrid solution, where you're actually not using batteries, but you are still using, starting with jet fuel, you're using a tur gas turbine to drive an electric generator, so you essentially convert the chemical energy and the fuel into electric energy, and then you use that to power the propellers or the propulsors on the airplane. And again, you can see in the case of the caravan, it's not quite clear why you would want to do that given today's technology. Turns out if you look back at some of the other things that Aurora has done, our conclusion is that electric propulsion may make sense when it's a distributed fashion, right? Where like on that XV24, there are multiple thrusters and the mechanical complexities of doing that with a standard gearbox or a, a, a mechanical drive um, would, would be so expensive from a weight point of view that you're better off moving it around, moving the energy electrically over, over some kind of wires uh, distribution system. So distributed electric propulsion combined with, it may be a key part of making electric buy its way onto large aircraft. Now, at the small aircraft side, the personal aircraft side, there may actually be a case where if you want to fly short distances, 50 miles or less, that electric propulsion, the advantages may in fact buy its way onto it. And so that's the area that we're looking at in these on-demand things. The other big thing we've got to look at in these is safety. And this is the, uh, the chart that, that is, uh, is probably going to be most problematic for, for, uh, for this pursuit is that the standards for safety in the national airspace system are extremely high. Now, it's not uniform. It's each, of, each of these those different sectors that I talked about at the beginning of the talk each has different training regulatory levels, and those translate into different safety levels, which you can see on this chart. The, the, the general aviation, which is essentially using uh, trained am but amateur operators, has a significantly higher accident rate than do Part 135, which is the uh, charter operators or the, uh, uh, the, the corporate aviation, and Part 121, which is the, the, uh, the commercial operators, the big, the big airlines, uh, they have developed a remarkably safe uh, means of transportation. And as we talk about putting new types of, of uh, vehicles into this system, we're going to have to make sure that they add to the safety of the overall system and not detract from it. So given those complexities, why would anybody want to do this? Well, this chart sort of looks at some of the many different market projections that are out there that say, if you could make an on-demand mobility service that would operate in, say, short duration uh, or short distance environments like around cities, you could address a lot of the congestion that's, that is uh, that is there today and getting worse every day, and that could turn into a fairly lucrative market, sort of a, uh, an on-demand service that has the third dimension. There are many, this is a, a subject of a lot of study uh, by a lot of different organizations, but the general conclusion is that depending on how far you go along this value chain from designing them, building them, operating them, servicing them, maintaining them, um, that there's some pretty significant commercial markets in there, and that is part of what's driving uh, this. It's not just the sort of passion angle of, boy, it would be great to fly myself, but it's the business angle that has, um, is, is driving so much of the enthusiasm for, for on-demand mobility. So here's the hypothesis of, of this talk, which is uh, maybe a little uh, non-obvious at first, and that is that the only technology that makes more pilots is autonomy. And let me just say that again so it sinks in, that the only technology that we see on the horizon that will effectively make more pilots and reverse that half a century long trend of declining number of pilots is autonomy. And 
really you look at what's happened in the commercial drones or even closer to home, look at what's happened in the cell phone market. It used to be that to operate a mobile radio, which is really what a cell phone is, uh, you had to be highly trained. You had to know Morse code. You had to have an FCC license. The equipment was large, bulky, uh, and you had to have a lot of training to, to use it. Today, essentially the number, uh, on, on a gross level, many of the people in the world have, uh, have cell phones. The number of cell phones is, and, the, and the population of the world have the same number of zeros at the end of that. It's really remarkable. They're so easy to use that they don't even come with instruction manuals anymore. And that's the kind of transformation that aviation needs to undergo if we're to see a really large scale change in the trends and take this sort of, uh, what, what it's, what's happened in the small drones is the introduction of autonomy has changed the whole nature of the user experience and that's led to that dramatic increase in the market and the dramatic increase in the number of users. Okay, so I wanna just walk through a couple of examples of that. One of the projects that Aurora has been doing is a project with the uh, Office of Naval Research and the U.S. Marine Corps, which is to develop helicopters that have sufficient perception on them that they can identify their own landing site, right? Today, a lot of unmanned airplanes go to a set of geographic coordinates and land there because they've been told that's a runway. It's important, when, if you're gonna have push this out into the on-demand mobility area, the airplanes are going to have to have the ability that humans have to survey a site and make a decision about what's an acceptable landing site, either for routine operations or for emergency operations. Um, this ACUS system, as it's called, uses a, a mobile device tablet and, a, and a, uh, an operator who's been trained literally for 10 or 15 minutes on how to use the system, and they can use that to summons a helicopter. The helicopter, the vehicle itself in this case is almost irrelevant. This is a Vietnam era uh, helicopter design that's been modified into a robotic helicopter, but the key part here is the perception and the autonomy system that allows it to be operated on demand today uh, by a uh, very lightly trained user using a, a, a commercial mobile device. That system is enabled by a combination of computers and sensors and uh, LIDARs on them that allow the vehicle to make a map in real time of the area that it's operating in. And you can do this either with or without a priori knowledge. In other words, um, with a map or without a map that you're starting from. But to survey the system, identify things that are there, make a map, and then apply algorithms to it to decide which areas are safe to land in and which areas are not. Combine that not just with the LIDAR, but with other information that you get from cameras, infrared systems, sometimes radars, and also things that you might know ahead of time to make a system that can reliably identify safe landing sites. That's a critical part of the technology that goes into this. Aurora believes that the key technology is certifiable autonomy for any class of vehicle, regardless of what that vehicle looks like. We think that that's where the key technology breakthroughs are, where the key markets are, and the focus is not on the vehicle as much as on the certifiable autonomy. Here's another example of how that works. This is an airplane called the Centaur, where we've taken an off-the-shelf general aviation airplane and converted it to operate robotically. So this airplane can fly today in the national airspace system with no one on board. It can also be operated as a normal general aviation airplane, so a pilot can fly it, a robot can fly it, or you can have people flying on it while the airplane is being operated robotically at a distance. In fact, last year in 2017, we had the governor of Virginia fly as a passenger aboard this robotic airplane. This is another example. This is a robot flying a 737 simulator in this case. This was part of a program done for DARPA called ALIAS, and this was looking at the next level of automation that could be applied to any type of aircraft. And at the end of that program, we did a demonstration where 
a robot sitting in the right seat of the airplane demonstrated its ability to fly the airplane, but not by grabbing the controls directly, but by operating the airplane's existing flight management system. So this video shows the robot using visions, vision techniques to go up, select controls on the cockpit, the same way a human would, move the knobs or flip the switches, just as a human would, use its visual system to determine that it had set it to the correct setting, and essentially have a, a robot flying a robot. This is a robot operating the computer system on the modern flight deck. And the demonstration in this was a, pi a scenario where the pilot would be incapacitated. Things that have actually happened, where the system is uh, depressurized at altitude and, and uh, the pilot's lost consciousness. Aircraft have actually been, been lost in that scenario. And this was demonstrating that the robot could handle that scenario take over control of the airplane, descend to a safe altitude, see if the crew would recover. If the crew didn't recover, the, air, the, uh, the robot went on and executed a, an auto land, programming the system to land itself, using the on, onboard capability of the airplane to do a Category 3 auto land, um, but it was being commanded by the robot. This is another example of something we call distributed electric propulsion and autonomy. This is a, an airplane, this is a subscale version of what we call the XV-24 lightning strike, a distributed electric propulsion concept that's designed to take off and land vertically and then transition to very high speed flight. And this subscale version is fully battery powered and fully autonomous. So this is a very close analog to what people are talking about for on-demand mobility. Now this particular airplane doesn't have the size or the power to lift an adult. It could carry 30 or 40 pounds. So it could carry a, a, a child, for example, on this airplane. Not that we would recommend that. But it's the basis for which we're scaling up and developing the next level of certifiable autonomy, which again, the vehicle may or may not look like the XV-24. That configuration is highly tailored to a mission that DARPA had laid out but the certifiable autonomy underpins everything that's going on. Here's another example. This is another configuration that Aurora developed as a possible passenger carrying design that would have uh, eight lift vans, lift rotors for lifting it vertically, and a single drive motor for translating it horizontally. The idea here being mechanical simplicity, right? Reliability being super important in this. This design was, uh, was built around the idea of mechanical simplicity and again, certifiable autonomy being the key underpinning everything. Now maybe it'll look like that, uh, this configuration, which was one of our first attempts at this, uh, but there's a lot of others. I mean, Aurora has several different designs on the drawing boards. And since uh, the Uber Elevate Summit of 2017, something like 100 different designs have been put out and published. I don't think any of us know what the successful design will really shake out to be, but certifiable autonomy will underlie all of it. The, the concepts that, have, that rely on a human flying it around may be great fun for recreation, but we don't believe they will make it as economic devices in any kind of transportation system simply because if you have two or four seats on an aircraft, you can't afford to devote one or two of those seats to an operator. And there's no need to. The certifiable autonomy can do that much, much more cost effectively than trying to train up human operators and have them operate in the complex networks that'll be required. So in summary, Whatever the vehicle looks like, and the GoFly competition is developing hundreds or even thousands of even new, of newer concepts, whatever the vehicle concept ends up looking like, certifiable autonomy is absolutely going to be essential to having that become a successful commercial product. So we're standing on the cusp of a revolution in mobility, and GoFly is a fantastic way to crowdsource some of that enthusiasm and have a chance for many different people to participate in this revolution. We're glad that you've chosen to be a part of that and we look forward to seeing what you come up with.